Uh, all right, let's start. Uh, so last week you discussed with uh, Felix in the previous lecture about the connection between uh, deep learning and uh, representation learning. So can somebody tell me what is the connection between these two initially looking non-related fields? Like any idea? Like why are we saying like deep representation learning? Yes? Because we're using deep learning models to be the representation. Yes, because the deep learning and the representation learning are interconnected, even in the supervised case, if you want to optimize for some task, you implicitly at least some some layers, some initial layers from your model implicitly learn the representation. You don't apply any feature selection and uh, feature engineering or anything. We're just giving, for example, the text or the images. All right. Uh, so today we will take a small uh, review uh, throughout the whole timeline regarding visual self-supervised representation learning. We will mostly talk about uh, images, but we will also slightly cover uh, videos as well, I think one approach. Uh, okay, before we start, uh, in, the, in the exercise you had to implement the, an autoencoder. So basically you had the input and then you had to reconstruct the input. Um, what would be the easiest way to improve the autoencoder as a baseline? Like how can you improve like from purely imitating the input to the output? Any ideas? What can you add in the input so that it looks more different on the output? You can add like noise, you know, in, uh, augmentations. I just want to see we didn't cover. I just want to say we didn't cover this in the exercise. But if you would like to improve the autoencoder, you could inject some noise in your input data, like Gaussian noise or augmentations, like uh, intensity transformations. All right. So the idea of uh, self-supervised learning was initially coined in the 1990s in uh, a paper from uh, Munich, Munich. Um, <clears throat> and it's pretty similar to the way we use the same term today. So self-supervised learning is kind of a general term that's used the latest years, and it encapsulates it Basically, it's a more specific term than an unsupervised learning because we don't have any labels from the data themselves, uh, like like a, like as a pair, like x being the input and y the label. We only have the data, but we kind of find the hacky ways to create labels and train with the with an objective as we would do in uh, self-supervised learning, for example, reconst reconstruction or cross-entropy. It's just that the label itself is obtained from the data. Uh, <clears throat> so here we have the timeline. Uh, so last week you discussed about the Benzio paper, mostly, with Felix. It was the, let's say, the introduction of the concept of representation learning. And another very important thing happened in 2012, that was kind of the beginning of deep learning in computer vision. Does anybody know? Okay, I will have. It's uh, the AlexNet paper, which was the first large scale uh, network. All right. <clears throat> so until a bit later, so from 2012 to 2016, uh, the only way we would be using visual representation learning was through supervised learning 
and specifically supervised transfer learning. So we have a large data set as uh, shown on the slide. So we have, we are still operating in the same domain. So if we're working with natural images, we're staying on natural images, but we find an, uh, like larger scale uh, data sets. For example, we want to have like a very good classifier for Cypher 10 or MNIST, and we're pre-training with supervised learning in a labeled data set from the same domain with much more data, which is ImageNet. Uh, for reference, ImageNet has 1.2 million labeled data, and it's uh, usually as far as you can get with some small single node with a couple of GPUs, at least in the university scale, more or less, usually. Um, so then, around 2016, as far as, uh, in parallel there were a lot of papers regarding autoencoders and stuff like that, similar to what we see in the images, but people started to come up with more handcrafted uh, tasks, pre-trained tasks for pre-training. We'll use the word pretext tasks for, for this. Pretext task is the task that the network is trying to solve and in the same time it learns the representation in the encoder layer. So encoder or backbone, we will use this terminology to indicate the initial layers, even though the pretext task might have like one or multiple MLPs or heads on top. All right. So in the self-supervised learning case, which is more applicable, you still stay in the same domain, so let's say still on the natural imaging domain, uh, but you don't need to have supervised data. So if, for example, we had a data with 10 million images without labels, we could leverage it for self-supervised learning, as most of the big companies like Google or Facebook are doing. So, any question regarding the difference between transfer learning and self-supervised learning? Right. Um, okay. So then we have an example. So let's say These are the training epochs, and this is the accuracy in percentage for n, n classes classification problem. And we tend to have this behavior if we do, if we directly start from a random initialization and try to basically do the same stuff with cross entropy and uh, supervised training on the, on the distribution of the, the task that we want to solve. We call the, this task the downstream task to, to distinguish it from the pretext task. So pretext task is what we pre-train. So here there is no pre-training. So a network starts from random initialization and uh, kind of gets the point So what would happen in the case of uh, transfer learning? So if we had some supervised model, how would this curve look like? Any idea? Yes? Probably it wouldn't start from zero accuracy. It would have some accuracy in the beginning, but maybe for... Okay, yeah, this is not zero, definitely. It's basically, this is like a random guess, but... Yeah, that's correct. It would start probably from a higher point. And then, yes? The initial part of the, the, of the curve might be steeper. Yes, so what does it mean steeper? It means it would, we would train faster. Mm -hmm. We would need, if here we need uh, 100,000 iterations. Ah, okay, we need epochs, so let's say 200 epochs. Epoch is, if 
the classifier, or if the network, in this case the backbone plus the classifier, sees all the data one time. So we start from probably a higher point, and we asymptotically read much, much faster the same IRC, and maybe we'd have some improvements. Usually we have improvements, actually, if we are staying in the same domain at least, if we are switching from natural images to from a large scale lateral images to a smaller scale data set. So when we say transfer learning, yes? The first curve is supervised or self supervised? No, this is there's no pretext task in the beginning. We just do supervised tuning on the on the end dates. So if it's cipher 10, this is directly supervised training on Cypher 10. So here, no, basically, let's say, random initialization. And supervised learning. Yes. And as I said, we probably would have some, we will also train much faster, like the could be steeper, but also we would have some performance gain. And this is how typically things were used to be done until 2016 to 2018. And sometimes there still does. So the problem is that we are still staying in the same domain. So for example, not for example, in practice all these supervised train models are, have been trained on ImageNet, which means that for more domain-specific applications, different domains, medical imaging, x-rays, uh, what kind of data, microscopy images, MRIs, 3D images, we cannot directly leverage those weights, even though there are some small evidence that um, you can use parts of those layers, or parts of those supervised layers. So random initialization is with blue. The difference here is that we are switching from uh, uh, pre-trained imaging weights to medical imaging, I think x-rays. So indeed we can train faster, even if we switch to another domain, but we cannot use all those layers. Can somebody speculate if we use like the first, let's say, three, four layers, or the last three, four layers from the from the ImageNet weights. If you had to choose between using the first three to four layers versus the last three to four layers of a pre-trained ResNet, which one would you choose? Yes. The first ones. Yes. So this this paper is about using the first three or four layers for different continents. So ResNet we've seen a lot, and InceptionNet is another type of uh, content. Um, so we can improve the speed and test the accuracy, but the test accuracy is marginal, mostly because we are switching to a completely new domain. So is it clear when I say domain, what, what do I mean? For example, natural images versus microscopy images. So this is a problem, and obviously the solution is visual self-supervised learning. Here I have the official definition. Pretext task is the terminology we will use throughout the semester, so you need to be very comfortable with it. Uh, so we design some pre-designed task, and the goal is to implicitly, by solving, by trying to solve this task, to learn uh, very relative features relative to the downstream task. And this is the second critical point that you need to have uh, all the time into your perspective, that uh, the downstream task really defines what is the optimal pretext task. 
And uh, what is the simplest possible pretest task that we have in the exercise? Basically, an autoencoder. And uh, yeah, sometimes it works. Uh, I think in the exercise you had, uh, with linear probing, you had something like 40%, 40 50%, and the random guess for 10 classes was 10%. <coughs> Uh, is it clear about the definition of the pretext and the downstream task? All right. So we are in 2016. Polarization. Can somebody formulate the problem in terms of like black box, like input output? What would be the input and the output? How would you implement that? Is it clear? Yes? Yeah. Okay, does the grayscale images and the output should be with more channels, like three channels for RGB? Yes. Um, and what type of network would you use? What type of network or network architecture? Um, maybe convolution. Convolution layers, but what kind of architecture? Since the input and the output should have the same size. Probably like a diversion, conversion, version, like it, it gets larger so we have more uh, dimensions at the end. Okay, Sven? A unit? Yes. So basically we want this type of unit networks, as you probably suggested, that we have these encoder and decoder blocks and basically the output and the input have the same shape. Uh, okay, practically speaking, I don't remember if they actually copy the grayscale weight three times, they probably do, or they feed one channel like, out of three channels, but uh, you can get the idea. And this one was one of the first ones, but it didn't find many applications later on. Um, so another thing, uh, another famous uh, paper is about uh, formulating these jigsaw puzzle, where you have an image and with some slight sips you pick, you pick uh, nine, uh, nine patches as indicated from the green squares with some slight sips and then uh, the network is presented with uh, these shuffled patches and it tries to reconstruct, to place them in the correct order you can frame it as a classification problem. Uh, so the authors uh, from 2016 again, they, are they, they, they said that we are trying to ignore the low level statistics. What do they mean by low level statistics? What do, what do we mean when we say about low level statistics? Yes? Pixel information, yes, I partially agree, but what would be some example? Here I give you some hints. So, for example, from this image to this image, what is the, yes? The histogram of the is quite different. Yes, so the color histogram can be regarded as a low level statistic. And even the texture, so color and texture are this kind of low, when, when, you, when you read papers and they write about low level information, low level statistics, they mean inform, information such as color and texture. And uh, here I write object localization. So since you're trying to learn the correct order, we're trying to encourage the network to learn some sort of localization. So what would be the, the downstream task for this specific pretext task. Any idea? Yes? Object detection? Yes. So, for example, here they use object detection as a downstream task. All right. Then we have images in painting. What do we do now? We we don't crop, but we fill with uh, 0 or 1 or 255 
So we take some pixels, they don't need to be uh, as indicated on figure 1a, they don't need to be uh, like a, a, a square, it can be any random mask. So we randomly uh, mask out uh, some parts of the information of the input image. And we are asking the model, as you can imagine, a unit, to, uh, to reconstruct um, this missing information to predict its pixel value. So this is again a unit, but what would be, how would you formulate the objective? What objective would you use similar to the exercise to what loss function would you use for this task? You did it last week? Yes? Yeah, mean square, mean square error L2 norm. Um, so I hope that you found out from the exercise uh, Basically, I should be the one who is asking that. You can also see it in uh, uh, sub image, sub figure B. Uh, oh, no, C, sorry. This L2 mean square error is the same thing in this purpose. Uh, so, what is the problem when you directly try to reconstruct with L2 and mean square error uh, when you try to reconstruct the pixels? Yes? can have a pretty low loss, but still get a very low output. Yes. So everybody who's using this L1 or L2 losses directly on the, on the pixels. Uh, usually, you have a very blurry uh, output. Uh, OK. So I will just formulate the task in a more mathematical way. So let's say we have mass, where 0 indicates the mass pixels, uh, which the answer will be dropped. And 1 indicates the unmassed pixels. And uh, We have a save, the same shape as the image H is the height and W is the width. Then we have an encoder, in this case, let's say a unit, a right encoder. And we have a B. Um, so I don't know if you, we haven't talked about this in the deep learning class. So we introduce a new network. So here you, it's, it's written as adversarial loss. So this is the discriminator, as you would see in the literature of uh, generative adversarial networks. And we can formulate the total loss as the reconstruction loss of x plus Uh, adversarial loss. So, as we suggested, I will put the blackboard back down, just give me a second to write the... So the construction loss is So this is the symbol to indicate the element-wise multiplication. It's called. It's also called Hadamard product in the literature. Sorry. And for those who are interested in the adversarial literature. And we we'll write down so E uh, denotes the expectation.
Can you read the, the character? Okay. So basically, this is half of the event. Um, so when you have this type of adversarial losses, when the two networks have different objectives, here I'm only showing you how you optimize the discriminator. So you would take the, the output uh, from the unit, so the reconstructed uh, part of the event, and you would feed it in the discriminator. But you would also feed the original event. So there is a small trick here, if you ever come across this type of networks or implementation. Um, has anybody worked with GANs and wants to speculate what, what is not shown at this moment? There is a small trick. Uh, when you train the discriminator, you should uh, do what we say as stop gradient or detach gradient. So don't detach in PyDorps. So this needs to be uh, detached so that the, basically the unit should not be updated and uh, the, the goal of the discriminator is to make the images more realistic. Okay, any questions here? Is it clear? Okay, so I would like to discuss uh, for a brief moment what is the purpose, what do we achieve with these two uh, lost terms? You can also add a hyperparameter to balance those two. But let's say L equals 1 to make our life simple. What is the pros and cons for the two loss? So for the reconstruction loss, <coughs> we, we all agree that it produces really blurry results. What does it get right? it gets right the overall structure of the image as you can see in number C here. It gets more or less the, the, the global structure or as you may read in the literature the kind of low, low level frequencies, the low frequencies. And what about the adversarial loss? It makes the, the images more realistically looking uh, because basically we're trying to make it impossible for the discriminator to distinguish between the real image X and the generated one of F of M element wise multiplication X. Any questions? Right. So next one is about videos. How would you formulate a pre-design, how you pre-design a task to learn a meaningful representation of videos. All the previous ones are hardly applicable. Does anybody have an idea? What would you do in the video? What would you enforce? Yes? Uh, computing new frames. Yeah, frame prediction is one. Uh, you give it like a sequence of n frames, and you're trying to predict the next one. This would be more closer to this one, because then you would have, again, the reconstruction loss and so basically, it's kind of image in painting where the image is the whole mass. Yes? But why would like, the image in painting like it is here not be possible with the video? I mean, it's just a it, bunch it, of It frames. is applicable. It's just that it's, nobody has published something like this with image in painting on videos. Like, even for video prediction, there are a couple of uh, literature. Yeah, in principle, you could definitely apply this. Uh, any other ideas apart from predicting the next frames or even interpolating between two frames? This could also formulate the task. Um, so in 2016, there were already some guys, this guy from Facebook, it's called Misra. Uh, he proposed this task where you have, so, I hope it's clear when we are when I'm talking about videos, we have a sequence of frames. Um, so instead of predicting the next one, as uh, you indicated, uh, they propose another task where basically they train a binary classifier, a convent which has like a binary classification head, and it just predicts if. Uh, 
if we have the original video, if uh, the frames that are sampled are consecutive or non-consecutive. So this is a very, very simple task. Uh, we are still in 2016, so don't expect so much. Even this kind of stuff, that you can learn some powerful representation and use it for... Um, yeah, maybe this is a question. What would be the downstream task for a model that learns which videos are uh, are indeed the frames in the video are consecutive or non-consecutive? When does this representation might be useful? Which type of video-based data sets, tasks? Any ideas? Uh, never mind. Uh, they argue that this representation is very helpful for action recognition. So when you do an action, it plays a role if the frames are consecutive. And another thing that we saw in the paper experimentally, not theoretically, most of the stuff in self-supervised learning are experimental. Uh, so don't expect too many theorems and proofs. Uh, they argue that the representations that they learn by aiming to solve the pretext task are complementary compared to uh, supervised learning on ImageNet, supervised transfer learning in general. So by supervised here I mean supervised transfer learning as a pretext task. Any questions regarding how would you do the, how you work with videos? Even though this is very far from state of the art. 2018. Um, so there is uh, this paper that uh, they propose a two-step approach. In the first, they, pro they train this kind of unit to basically an autoencoder unit-like method. And then in the second step, they try to do this GAN, Generative Adversarial Network Dynamics, to add a discriminator and try to, to distinguish between the autoencoded outputs, the autoencoded image, versus the real images. Uh, not so interesting, I'm just showing it for consistency. Uh, this one, where you will actually implement the next exercise, is very easy. I'm still surprised it works. It's just if you if you formulate a task where you take an image and you rotate it with multiples of 90, so either 0, 90, 180, or 270, and you basically you have a four four classes to classify. So you have like a small ConvNet, ResNet, whatever, plus a head with a softmax, and then four classes. And this works extremely well. I'm still surprised that this approach worked. So this was proposed in uh, 2018. And it has found uh, a tremendous number of applications. People are still using this thing. That's why you will also implement it in the next exercise. Uh, the principle, as argued in this paper, uh, from 2018 is that by learning the rotation you learn more high level features or high level objects as I'm writing here heads, noses, eyes of the objects but as well their relative positions because they are also rotating. Um, any questions regarding rotation prediction? No? I find it quite an easy exercise. I hope you will find it uh, doable. Okay, then there is this kind of experiment, comprehensive experimental studies. This is a paper from Google uh, AI from Zurich. So basically they say, okay, we have all these kind of tasks. So rotation is a rotation prediction from the previous slide. And Zigsaw is uh, from 2016, the one that I showed. I didn't present the other ones, but they're relatively similar. And they say, let's see what happens across different architectures. And they find that even between different versions of ResNets, 
So V1 and V2 are, I guess, some resins with a higher number of parameters or slightly different layers. And the results are not even consistent. Um, so all the literature in many, many tasks, including self-supervised learning, was developed until the introduction from, of vision transformers in uh, 2019. Uh, 2020. So all the literature before the vision transformer was basically published and benchmarked for ResNet and mostly ResN50. Uh, but they found out that it's not even consistent across different pretext tasks and not even consistent across different architectures. Um, and we already know that it's not even consistent across different downstream tasks. Each downstream task may have a better pretext task. Um, still, you can see that rotation prediction works quite well except from the green one, which is this version, ResNet ver version 1. It consistently outperforms the other handcrafted tasks, even though it's such a simple approach. OK. Then we will define uh, semi-supervised learning, which is the scenario where you have a small number of supervised data and a large number of unsupervised data from, from the same task, and you would like to integrate those uh, unsupervised data uh, in your model. And it's called consistency loss uh, from, uh, I think it's a paper from Google. Um, so basically, we're trying to find ways to incorporate this information. I will write a bit of math because I don't find the figure extremely helpful. So theta are, the, theta are the parameters, and we have a supervised objective, okay, x1, y1, and we also have a hyperparameter, and then unsupervised of x and q. So what is q? So q is uh, the data transformation that need to be applied to, let's write x2, so that I want to say that this data and this data are completely different, completely different images. So q is uh, a stochastic data transformation and we use the notation from the paper so we sample from a stochastic data transformation what is an example for image transformations what is the simplest and commonly used example when we're, when we're applying augmentations or image transformations? Yes? Contrasts and uh, like yeah. rotations. Uh, 
Yeah, rotation is a good example here. So we, we saw before that they use the, the 90, 100, like the multiples of 90 rotations as a data transformation, and then they try to classify. But uh, in this case, this Q needs to have some property, some, it needs to be stochastic, okay? But the most important property is that it needs, uh, I don't know if this is helpful, so basically, we want to enforce the consistency between a non-augmented image or non-augmented representation of the image and an augmented representation. So this Y, even though these data are unlabeled and we don't know them, this Y needs to be the same. So basically, the label information needs to be retained. So that's why, for example, in this application, rotations are not applicable. But for example, of course, you can apply these color changes or uh, cropping at some particular range. For example, if you crop 1%, probably doesn't make sense because you lose the information. But in general, all these data sets, these computer vision natural imaging data sets are mostly objects, single objects placed in the center of the image. That's why cropping and random, cropping of random scale usually works. So be very careful when you think about for each task what augmentations you need. So here let's say cropping and intensity transformations. Um, okay. I may need to So this is the P of uh, uh, subscript L is the data set, the labeled data set. C is the cross entropy, the common objective we use. So this is more or less stuff we have seen a lot in deep learning in the first semester. What is new is the second term. Yeah, e all the time is the, the expectation. So we have x2 sample from the unlabeled distribution. That's what this uh, subscript u stands for unlabeled. And we also have x hat. Q I think this is more correct. And we take the X2 and then we apply the stochastic transformation. Then we have cross entropy. We will create a timeline again, don't worry. This is a, an indication of uh, divergence. So cross entropy between this and this. Uh, yes? We prevent that the unsupervised consistency loss collapses just using the supervised cross entropy loss, right? So the right part of this network 
could let and always predict the same class. And it would be like an optimal solution. But we prevent this using the same model on the left side. Yes. We are training the same model M uh, jointly. But there is another very small indication that I, I haven't shown in the equation, but it's shown here. Uh, there is this uh, tilde here. Um, so this indicates that uh, the parameters of the networks that sees the non-augmented image are uh, freezed. So basically there is a stop gradient operation uh, here. So this also prevents the network, experimentally at least, to collapse. So, yes, you answered the question that was coming. Nice. Um, so usually, um, okay, let's write cross entropy. <coughs> cross entropy is not symmetric, and then we have. And this is the symbol from for the entropy. Um, so basically, this is the first paper I have read that uses the indication of cross entropy. Usually, when we have two different augmentations, uh, we tend to use KL divergence. Does somebody know the connection between cross entropy and KL divergence? So, so I will continue from here. basically cross entropy can be decomposed to the KL divergence. This is the definition if you open Wikipedia or whatever, compared like their divergence. And this is the, uh, the second term, um, which basically is the entropy of P1. So when we have labels, we use this one hot encoding as the target. So P1, in the case of supervised learning, are the labels. And here, we enforce uh, the entropy of uh, the labels when we have the one hot encoding distribution of the labels. Um, the difference is that here, uh, it's slightly different because even though we have and non one hot encoding distribution, the gradients are not flowing, so no gradients will be added from this term. If gradients are added, we tend to use KL divergence in the literature. When we have the, the output of the network, for example, uh, one example is knowledge distillation, so we have a very large model, and we take its output and make a very small model to mimic the output of the model. This is a case where you, we you typically use uh, KL divergence and not cross entropy. So I find, I find it really helpful. And uh, so if you read this paper, you can compare it with other papers. That's, that was the point. Uh, 
and they write in the paper that uh, this is a way to propagate labeled information from labeled examples to unlabeled examples. This is a more intuitive explanation. Any question about the approach or the math? All right. Um, and then we reach the tipping point, which is one uh, very core point of interest that we will emphasize in uh, one or two lectures in the upcoming weeks, which is contrastive learning. We will only briefly discuss about it for a, for a couple of uh, minutes. I just want to show you the math. Sorry? Yes? I have one question regarding, regarding the last, uh, last function. What's, yeah. what's the difference between f and uh, p of theta? Yeah, so here I replaced f is like the, the model. Uh, I think it's they use f in the M is the model in the figure, I use the term F, and here I use a different, a more statistical notation from the paper itself. I just replaced cross entropy to make it clear it's the same stuff we do on supervised learning. This is a more statistically looking notation. I don't like it, but I want to stick to the paper. <coughs> So I will only briefly discuss uh, contrastive learning. Uh, Felix and I will cover it extensively in the lecture and you will also do exercise classes with it. I just want to show it as the, the tipping point. So we had from 2016 to 2020 we had all these kind of handcrafted features and the bottom line is that a very simple one that works kind of out of the, out of the box for natural images is rotation prediction. And everything else has some improvement, but it's not working that greatly. And then after uh, this objective, it's called SimCLR loss or contrastive loss, there is a totally new field coming up. So going back to the timeline, for a brief moment. So 2020 was a great year for computer vision. So the first very big thing is the vision transformer. So even though the transformer was used in natural language, it was initially proposed in 2017 for natural language translation. Uh, and then here, one year later, we have this bear, which we'll cover in the le next lecture, which is basically how to leverage all these large corpus of text. We'll not cover it now. It took three years for finding out uh, an established way to make transformer work for vision. And in parallel, we have this SimCLR or contrastive, uh, where even though the, the objective itself, that we will write it down on the blackboard, it, it was not something new, it existed for one or two years. This is the paper who studied it at scale and showed all the why it works, how to make it work and uh, that's why it has a uh, really high value. So basically all the, the advances from 2020 came from these two fundamental papers on 2020 and even though I'm saying 2020 that something is published, it takes a lot of time to be adopted widely for all the other community, for example, if you work on medical imaging, all the publications and all the literature takes one to two years to sift from the advancements from Google AI or Facebook AI on natural images. And a very funny moment, it's uh, 
because of these two publications, in the middle of 2021, I decided to do my PhD. And all the things that we will cover uh, are deeply connected to vision transformers and SimCLR in the next three lectures. And <coughs> we'll also cover the state of the art. All right. So we have these emails. I was also extremely excited when I managed to create these emails. So basically, we have a box of n images. So here, to make it very simple, I have two images. And for each image, we have two views. And then we compute the similarity. We, we, we pass the images from a backbone model, plus a small MLP, but it's not so important. So we take all these features and compute the similarity. So in general, this uh, similarity matrix the similarity matrix S for two views. In general, it's views times the bat size. Uh, but let's say we have two views. So we have two augmentation, two, two different stochastic transformations of the same image. And we compute this similarity matrix, which is 4 by 4 in this case. And the objective uh, for each one of the green squares, which is basically the similarities that we want to maximize. So basically, if you see here, we want to maximize the similarity between image one, view one, and image one, view one. Yes. So basically, we want to maximize the agreement between two different augmentations from the same image. Um, and these are also called in the literature as positive pairs. Positive pairs are not necessarily views created from the same image, but it can also be images with the same label, let's say cut, um, but then it would be kind of supervised because we know the label. So we create a pair by picking two cuts and then trying to, two different images of cuts and then trying to maximize their similarity or agreement in general. So for each green uh, square, as indicated in the figure, we have this loss. And then, of course, we will average all the losses from the green squares in the bat, so from all the positive ones. But the loss looks as follows. So Z indicates that we are talking about the features and not the images, and specifically not just the output of the backbone that is indicated as H in the top right figure, but Z. There's this G is just an MLP, so a multi-layer perceptron with uh, a very high dimension in the middle, hidden dimension. T is a temperature, so temperature scale uh, softness, but let's say this is the temperature, it's just a hyperparameter. We don't care so much at this point. Similarity is the cosine similarity. Uh, 
Um, so I just want to uh, give you a very short introduction because I find it a very critical point for uh, the research regarding deep uh, representation learning. Um, so basically, this is what we're saying, maximizing agreement, uh, the nominator. These are ZI and ZZ refer to a positive pair. So we are only talking about the four green squares. And this I basically is a, is a mask is a square mask with the shape of S that basically zeroes out all the diagonal elements. So basically these are all the non-diagonal elements of this uh, square matrix of similarity. So the problem is that um, without the denominator this can collapse. Uh, just by directly maximizing the similarity. So, the big advancement of this paper is that it kind of got together all the different components that needed and studied them independently, the augmentation, how this G uh, MLP should look like, and many other things. And, um, yeah, this is what I want to show for today. Any questions regarding this uh, equation, this, this law? Yes? Yeah. Is it usually done in this like binary setup, like two contrasted images? Two views, it's very common. But size of two, no. Uh, so like two views, but maybe more than two images, like. Uh, Basically, the, yes, the bat size, if, if you say like for one bat, we take multiple two views from each sample. Um, yeah, basically, it's actually a very good point because in order for this loss to work, it's really sensitive to the bat size. So you need a bat size of at least 512 to make it work. So this similarity matrix for bat size 512 is 1024 by 1024 and then you need a lot of resources, a lot of GPUs, maybe multiple GPU training. That's why it also comes with uh, during the timeline with the advancements with uh, PyTorch and all these frameworks. All right. Then uh, I would like to argue a little bit, to discuss a little bit about how much does do this uh, supervised, self-supervised learned features transfer to different downstream tasks and how they compare to, to different downstream tasks and also different pretext tasks. Um, so for the sake of this conversation, we will only uh, take a look at the green star, which is the supervised, basically supervised transfer learning, versus, let's say, the red cross. The method itself doesn't matter, because it's from the fact things we will cover in the lecture. So for all the plots, the x-axis is the image net accuracy, basically the task that it's trained on. The the data distribution that they were trained on, and then top one accuracy either with fine tuning or linear probing. And the y axis is basically the performance on four different tasks. Uh, so these are like different data, this is another data set for linear probing and fine tuning. This is a few shot in some other data sets, and they also have some plots that look kind of similar for object detection, semantic segmentation, etc. Um, so the bottom line, like the three main things you need to remember is that uh, it is highly argued in the literature that self-supervised learned features are more transferable, but this paper in 2021 was the first one who kind of showed this in a large scale experimental study. Uh, second, there is not always a single self-supervised method, at least given that we have a specific 
pre-training data set here at Imagelab that kind of is uh, the solution or the best possible choice for all the different uh, downstream tasks. And third, they provide some small analysis that uh, these uh, features, when they train a classifier on the downstream task, are the classifiers, they lead to more calibrated and uh, less prone to overfitting on the downstream task. Any questions? Right. And now we go to 2023, because uh, some of you are really interested to see how far can we push the performance. So this is the latest uh, paper from, from Google, I think, uh, released uh, a couple of one or two months ago where they trained uh, a vision transformer with 22 billion parameters and if you just see this column, IM stands for ImageNet it achieves uh, just with uh, linear probing so I hope from the exercise it's clear to everybody what is linear probing you take the features from the pre-trained model and then you train a single linear layer with standard cross entropy on, uh, on ImageNet and it achieves 89% uh, with linear probing. Frozen means that the features, like the backbone, is not trained. So we will use this idea of linear probing extensively for all the exercises. So in this exercise, we may you implement these ideas, but everything we implement once in the next exercise it will be given as a function and you can just call it. So, 89 is, uh, yeah, the thing that I have not discussed is that this is also pre-trained in a much larger uh, supervised data set that is not even probably public. Yes? Is this uh, top one that you see? Yes, top one I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's not really, it's top one I guess. Um, and the, the good thing is that it's with linear probing, so the information exists already in the features. We will talk later on in the course about uh, how this large-scale pre-training results in uh, many kind of interesting properties that are learned in the features of the, of the transformer. And uh, how far can we go with self-supervised training? So basically, here, we have supervised and version 2. So SSL starts for self-supervised learning, sometimes I use this abbreviation. Um, so they trained this uh, Giga version of the Vision Transformer in 142 million images uh, and achieved uh, a validation accuracy, so this, this is linear probing, uh, of uh, 86.5 on ImageNet. Kind of similar, di di totally different data sets, same architecture. Okay, just to summarize, I hope it didn't take so much for the lecture. Uh, three main points is that um, the representation are dependent, highly dependent of the downstream task. And um, usually, at least sometimes, most of the times it's also architecture dependent, even though with the latest models they everybody's just adopting uh, the vision transformer, we will cover it probably later in the course. Even though we haven't actually talked about it, it's not significantly different from the transformer itself we have seen in the deep learning class. Uh, second is that uh, self-supervised learning is, uh, it is well established at the moment that self-supervised learning results in really transferable features, meaning that we can take these features and apply it in, a, in another task, even in the different domain, not even in the same domain. 
and it tends to be better than supervised transfer learning because of the scale of the data is much higher than the data we can actually annotate with human annotators. And supervised learning also has some noise because there may be multiple objects in the class. So a human annotator will only annotate one object. Um, and lastly, which is kind of not true for the latest advancement, but as far as the approaches of the visual self-supervised representation learning approaches we have discussed uh, in the course, in this presentation, so far there is no one that kind of dominates and is the best one across multiple downstream tasks, even though uh, the last years it looks like there is one. Alright, questions? All right. There are some references, so all the papers that I present have some reference in, at, at the bottom of the page if you want to take a look at the math and explanation of the figure in the main text. Um, but this is like a some fundamental blog posts and papers that I also use. Um, yeah, that's it for today.